This is Algebra 2, Chapter 5, Section 4, in which we will be analyzing graphs of polynomial functions. We've done something similar to this last chapter with the quadratic functions that we were doing. <clears throat> now we're going to be dealing with higher-powered problems, higher-powered functions to deal with. So they're going to ask us to graph this function by making a table of values. And there's no, you know, when we did uh, quadratic functions, we had the idea to get the vertex and get that in the middle. There's not an easy algebraic way to get there, to get some point to start from. So I'm just going to pick some numbers. And I picked negative 2.5, negative 2, negative 1.5, and, and so forth, all the way up to positive 2.5. And then what I did at that point, or what I'm going to do here, as it were, is I'm going to substitute negative 2.5 in for all these x's, and I get some values. Substitute negative 2 in, I get a value. Substitute negative 1.5 in. All I did, guys, was just punch this on the calculator and copy down my answers. And then the same thing with these numbers. Now, don't get fixated that you have to make two tables. I just didn't have room down here to put the rest of the table on it. So I split mine into two parts, but it doesn't really matter. Something else to notice here, you're not guaranteed any symmetry like we were last chapter. We can't say whatever we get at 1 is going to be the same as 2 or anything like that. We have to actually punch these things in. So we punched them in, went through the calculator, and got these values. And then it's not hard to graph it. All you have to do is plot all those points and then connect it. So I plotted all those points. If I drag my graph out of the way, you can see all the points where I plotted them. And then I just drew in as best I could with what I had. So graphing them isn't hard, it's just a bit time consuming because you have to go through a whole bunch of numbers. Okay. Now, and, and this is something else that we touched on last chapter. When the value of the function changes signs from one point to the next, then we know there's a zero somewhere in between. Okay, jumping back to the previous one, I went from a positive 2 to a negative 8.1. So somewhere between negative 2... and negative 1.5, there's a zero. Okay. We can't tell where it is just from looking at this, but we know it's in there somewhere. And this idea is called the location principle. So when they say to you to use the location principle, that's what they're talking about. It's just saying we know it's in between here and here. <laughs> So they're going to ask us to determine consecutive integer values so that x, or for those values, so that the function has a zero in between these two numbers. And they specify integers, so I'm not going to put any 0.5s or anything of that sort. I'm just going to put positive and negative whole numbers. So I'm just going to start trying some to see what I can get. If I punch in negative 3 to the function, I get a beautiful answer of 142. If I put in negative 2, I get an answer. Negative 1, 0, 1. Okay. Notice what just happened. We went from a positive value to a negative value. So we know there's an answer in there somewhere. Negative still, negative still, 
jumps back to positive. So we know there's an answer in here somewhere. So we are going to report that we have a solution somewhere between 0 and 1, because it went from positive to negative, and also somewhere between 3 and 4, because it went from positive to negative. Okay, That's all we're doing with those kinds of problems, is we're just punching in a bunch of x's and trying to find where they are, where the signs change from one value to the other, from positive to negative or from negative to positive. One more thing they want us to look at is the idea of relative maxima and relative minima. Okay. What you're looking at you're, or what you're looking for are peaks and valleys. And you're looking for peaks and you're looking for valleys. For example, right here, this point where my cursor just went, that is a relative maximum. It's higher than anything close to it. This point, where I just moved to right down here, is a relative minimum because it's lower than the stuff around it. This is another maximum. This is another minimum. They want us to estimate the x-coordinates. So what does x equal at these places? Well, we have a maximum right up here. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Somewhere around negative 7. I just picked negative 7.5. Okay, if you're in the right neighborhood, you're, I'm going to cut you slack and say it's good. You don't have to be exactly dead on the money. Now here's another one where there's a max at 1, 2, somewhere between negative 2 and negative 3. I just called it negative 2.5. Okay. Same idea for the minimum. It looks like here this is on about negative 5, counting over. And this one looks to be on positive 1. And then just like we did last time, we're going to talk about end behavior. What's the function doing as it goes off toward the far extremes? As x gets more and more negative, the function gets more and more negative. Just like we wrote about on the previous lesson. And at the positive side, as x gets more and more positive, the function gets more and more positive. So we wrote those kinds of things before when we did end behavior. Um, consider for a second what kind of function are we talking about? An even power or an odd power? Since they go opposite directions, if they were to ask us this, we could tell them it's an odd powered function because they go in opposite directions at the extremes. So not a lot to this, just punching in numbers and coming up with values. Looking for where you have sign changes. And then locating where you have maxes and mins. And as always, if you had questions along the way, hopefully you wrote those down. Bring them in so you can ask in class, and we will see you in class.